Uh, so the passage I'm going to read is about the moment I discovered that there are some things, much to my surprise, that I only want to talk about with my mother. So here we go. Uh, this starts shortly after our second child was born. After Claire arrived, during a morning so grueling that when I think about it, my lady parts clamp shut in a sustained involuntary kegel. Let's all kegel together. Just kegeling for a cause, you know what I'm saying? We moved out of a rental flat in Berkeley. There's a lot of men in here that just said, what's a kegel? <laughs> we moved out of a rental flat in Berkeley and into a well-priced fixer-upper in a tiny suburb with very good public schools. I played house, turning doors into chalkboards, making benches from plywood, sewing an ottoman slip cover that my mother-in-law joked after a couple of glasses of Pinot Grigio, doesn't do your living room any favors, honey. I started building my new life, collecting my own pigeons for the road ahead, and I began the transition from my father's breezy relationship with the world to my mother's determined navigation of it. At first, parenthood was as I'd expected, exhausting, sometimes heinous, occasionally divine. I held my children close, close enough to feel them breathe, laugh, swallow, then my days got more complicated, and although there's nothing unusually challenging about my children, I often find myself responding to their sudden and inscrutable moods, mighty wills, and near constant arguing by turning into a wild-eyed fishwife. Edward, my husband, was afraid that people wouldn't know what a fishwife was, and I said, my people will know what a fishwife is. Some interactions are so strangely familiar, it's as if I once starred as little orphan Annie, and then, decades later, found myself cast in the revival as Miss Hannigan. <laughs> By way of example, here's a memorable excerpt from a conversation with Georgia regarding her third grade report on cheetahs. You missed a section, honey. No, I didn't. The page on reproduction is totally blank. I know, I googled it, and there was nothing. <laughs> Oh, I bet there are half a million pages about cheetah reproduction. Not on Google, not when I put it in the nav bar thingy. She says, air typing, as if I'm new to the internet and might need a little help following her. Maybe you spelled it wrong. I know how to spell cheetah. I was thinking reproduction. R-E-P. I promise you, there are many sites on the internet that discuss cheetah reproduction. I say with great manufactured calm, trying a trick that involves pretending your child is not your child, <laughs> but rather just a child, any child. But mom, stop, enough. Work, work on something else, else, but do not say one more word. After Georgia storms off, Edward says, when I first met you, you didn't drink coffee, and you were so mellow. How can I tell him that I was a dog in show? <sighs> High stepping with my shiny hair and sparkly striped collar, Twelve years and two puppies later, I'm an ungroomed bitch. <laughs> I don't know if that cheer means, yeah, you are, or like, yeah, I am, or... I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna interpret it. Uh, beneath my frustration is real fear. If a child can't find a single word online about cheetah propagation, what kind of future can she hope for? <laughs> That's why I snap and storm around and then spend long nights thinking of the most damaged adults I know and wondering if my particular brand of maternal fuck-ups are how they ended up like that. My passionate engagement frees Edward from just about all worry. He sleeps fine. He talks to his friends about road bikes. He stews about his job. Why should he fret about the girls when I'm pacing the ceiling off the hardwood floors? It would be redundant. 
Recently, he called with good news. We were invited up to Tahoe for four days with the O'Sullivans. Our girls can ski with their girls, and we can have an adult day on the mountain. This was a flawed plan. <laughs> or at the very least, a plan that required some consideration. Ten years into our marriage, I had learned to push back using fact, not feeling. I thought we were in a period of post-Christmas austerity. Didn't you say we needed to get our burn rate back under control? I mean, four days at Spa, that's 16 lift tickets. So we just not going to ski ever? The real problem with Freddie Fun's Tahoe plan was that the O'Sullivan girls skied 20 days last winter on double black diamonds. Our, girl, our girls are what the savvy ski schools call advanced beginners. <laughs> Which meant, without a parent to slow her down, Claire would hop off a ski lift and fly in whatever direction the, sl the slope took her. Fly with her hands high and her skis tight together. Fly until she met a tree, or another skier, or the cliff's edge. While Georgia would ride to the top of the mountain with the very able Maggie O, and go wherever she led, even the Olympic runs, crying behind her ill-fitting loner goggles. <laughs> Hating her inexperience. Did Edward not know this? Could he not feel her insides clench like I could? How are they going to learn if we don't let him try? Edward wanted to know. I don't want them to grow up scared of mountains and rivers and whatever else makes you nervous. I want them to be gamers, be on the go team. Here I thought I married George Corrigan's daughter. Don't tell me I married. Watch it. I'm not sure who Edward married. Maybe the person he married became a different person because maybe that person is the right person for the job. Maybe that person will take on the cheetah report and protect over and under confident children on ski slopes and manage the unsettling situations that often bubble up right around bedtime. One particularly tough night, I'd broken a wine glass while I was doing dishes, and Claire was still upset that I'd forgotten to take her down to the softball field that afternoon so she could be in the team picture. And let's just, does she play softball anymore? She does not. <laughs> and let's just say the day was pleading to be done. Okay, girls, bedtime. I get to stay up longer, Georgia said. Why? Claire asked. Because I'm two years older. Not for long, Claire said. Forever. Georgia replied, too casually for a truth so cruel. Nah, someday I'll be nine. Right, but when you're nine, I'll be 11. I will always be older than you. Claire looked at me, and then at her sister, and then back at me. Surely this was not the case. <laughs> She's right, honey. This was as bad as anything I'd had to tell her over the years. Older, Georgia said, ignorant of the existential magnitude. Always and forever. <laughs> Claire made the face that preceded the noise that meant she was going to wail, and then it would all be over, because when she goes, she goes to 11. Georgia, please stop. She gets it, okay? You made your point. Why are you yelling at me? I'm not, I yelled. As I wrangled Georgia into her room, I heard Claire crying. I leaned in. What's the matter? Are you mad at Georgia? Yes, I'm frustrated. The bickering makes me crazy. What did you say? The same thing I always say, leave it alone, walk away. She broke into a sob. It's okay, Claire, I'm just saying. It's not that. She snapped. Claire, honey, what is it? I readied myself for a confession. When she finally spoke, her voice was very small. Do you love one of us more than you love the other? No, do you think I do? Yes! She spat out the deepest possible betrayal in her voice. You think I love Georgia more than I love you? No. I think you love me more than you love Georgia. To her mind, this was the most unforgivable treason. This violated a fundamental maternal vow. Dropping off the girls the next morning, I looked for anyone I might be able to talk to about the night before. I ran into Beth and then Christy, but I didn't know how to launch into the story, and I felt strangely self-conscious about Claire's concern. Besides, every mother on campus had her own problems, so I turned back toward Mountain Avenue and dialed my mom. 
Hey, so Claire said the strangest thing last night. She said she thinks I love her more than I love Georgia. What am I supposed to do about that? Well, I'll tell you, she started. You do your damnedest to keep things even, Stephen, and I mean everything. Presents, sleepovers, eye contact. <laughs> your brothers once fought over tube socks. I'd put them in their stockings, and GT ended up with an extra pair, and I swear to God, it almost ruined Christmas. It's going to be a long 10 years. 10? I still keep lists. Loans, visits, babysitting, you never stop tracking that one. Lovey, my dad picked up the other phone. Hey, Greeny. Lovey, great to hear your voice. While he told me about playing golf last week, I nod on the fact that in addition to helping the girls parse the world and all its awful truths, time only goes one way, things end, affections wax and wane. I was the sole distributor of the strongest currency they would ever know, maternal love. Thank you.